I need us to understand this morning that it could be you're facing what you're facing and will continue to face what you're facing, not because it's so weighty, it's because we don't really have the desire to truly be delivered. Until you reach to the point where you're just not sick of it, I, some of us got to get to the point where we're just tired of being tired. <laughs> I'm just tired. I'm not just tired of it. I'm tired of being tired. Mm. So we have, do you think it's possible for me to deliver you? Or are you fine? So there's no need for me to go through the motions. If you cool. If you cool the way you are, God bless you. May the Lord watch. I don't know the rest of the phrase. I just know that's how I start. <laughs> I just wanted to say that somehow. The, 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 the seasoned folks up front know how to say it. Okay. <laughs> Man, we are in a series right now called Life Be Life In. Um, I don't know if this is installment five or six, but just make some noise if you're enjoying this series. For those of you who are not privy to the series that we are in, this series allows us to look at what we're facing through a very privileged perspective. That privileged perspective is through a spiritual lens. Uh, that we've defined life being life uh, to, to be those moments where we feel overwhelmed and there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> I've prayed and it feels like God ain't moving. I've fasted and it feels like God don't hear me. We've touched and agreed and it feels like our prayers are not making it to the rightful space that we call heaven. And, and, I, I, and we've been challenging you all, be it me, Minister Jim or Minister Jared, to think deeply about how you're viewing what you're facing. We've talked about how the Lord and the enemy, the L and the E, these two entities, these individuals play a unique role in whatever we're facing. And today we're going to zero in on that I, the imperfect world that we live in. We, we, because we are born into sin, that means that we will face inevitably some obstacles. Man, if you will look at our scripture for today, we're going to look at John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And I believe this is going to challenge, it's going to encourage, and keep in mind that, that I, I want us to know my job is to meet you where you are, to validate where you are, but at the same time, you can't stay there, Kyla. <laughs> I can't babysit you and coddle you into the situation that you're facing. I must pull you from where you are after saying, it's real, but we can't stay there. And, and, and we're going to look at a passage today that I think many of us can identify with. And it reads as follows. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked this question to him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Someone intercedes for what I believe is my blessing. Someone arrives before I do. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk anyways. <laughs> instantly, say instantly. Instantly. The man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Before I give our title today, I want to look at verse 3. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill, sick for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Today, for those of us who are taking notes, I'm speaking from this subject, I'm sick of this. 
I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of this. How many of you, you feel like I've been listening to you in your prayer closet? That speaks to where you are right now. You just, when you think about a specific issue in your life, you're sick of it. This is an expression that's rooted in a deep frustration. And it's not that uh, the, the issue itself is the issue. It's how long you've been facing the issue. <laughs> I, if you're honest, I've been through worse things. I've been through more challenging things. I've faced larger mountains. I've, I've, I've climbed steeper hills. But this issue, I can function with it, but I just want it to go away. In fact, if I'm honest, Maxine, it's, it's not that, 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 that I like problems, but God, I'm ready for a new type of problem. <laughs> Give me a new challenge. Give me a new beast to tackle. Give me a new monster to pray about. Give me new obstacles to navigate. God, I'm sick of this one. This, this, this right here speaks to a harsh reality that many of us are facing. And keep in mind, I want to challenge us this morning in our thinking. I want to debunk this ideology that I'm talking about physical challenges only. I'm talking about the emotional things we're sick of. I'm talking about the psychological bondage that some of us are in. I'm talking about the spiritual battles that are rooted in sinful nature that I'm, I'm talking to those layers beneath the surface. But ladies and gentlemen, as real as our issues may seem, I want to challenge us in our thinking this morning, Cam. We can't be, here's our first note, we can't be so infatuated with the issue that we fail to realize the influence it's had on who we become. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. We can't be so infatuated with the issue that we fail to realize we remain unaware about the degree of influence and impact on who we've become. Pastor, what do you mean by that? Some of us are so infatuated with the issue that we don't realize things like hopelessness have crept into our spaces. We become so infatuated with the issue that spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, we've thrown in the towel. We were once gritty. We were once tenacious. We were once resilient. But we don't realize because this issue is so uh, potent in our lives that we've lost our way and lost sight of who we are. In other words, a problem that was temporary, we've diagnosed as permanent. All because we're so fixated on the issue, I, I, want, I want to free us this morning. Here's the thought that I want to give us before we dive into our text today. I can't control what you are facing. In fact, I can't even promise you that specific things that you are facing, you will be liberated from. But I can encourage you to reconsider how you feel about what you are facing. I'm going to say that again. I can't control what you are facing, but our teaching this morning, I will help you reconsider how you feel about what you are facing. Because it's one thing to know that it ain't going nowhere, but if I have the right attitude, the right mindset, the right perspective, then I know I'm going to be all right. I know I'm going to be okay. I'm sick of this. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't noticed, Job, what we saw in Job is quite contrary so what we're going to talk about today, Job, primarily, we focus on the external challenges, the challenges that exist from without of our experience, the things that we see, the things that are around us. But I want to place this consideration in your lap. The external things are one thing, but the internal battles we face, it's a whole nother thing. Because the internal battles, we can be fighting things or losing to things and we don't even know it because it's from within and we don't, there's no one around us to say, hey, you may want to consider the level of hope you have. Yeah. Yeah. I want to I get into our, our learning today by giving us some historical context here. This right here, about in 1888, uh, there were some uh, theologians, some historians that got to digging and they ran into what was called the Pool of Bethesda, among some other things. And this is what a depiction, generally speaking, of what it would look like. Uh, the Pool of Bethesda, for those of us who are taking notes, Bethesda means house of mercy. House of mercy. It's also to a note that this pool, as you see, there are two sections, but the scripture indicates that there are five 
porches. The five porches are the outer or the exterior components of this pool. So we have one up here. We have two that run that way. And then we have another one that runs towards the left side of my screen, your right. So under, on each side, there were coverings called porches. This was a massive pool. It was about uh, 360 feet long, massive, about 450, 400, excuse me, 45 feet deep, and uh, somewhere around 100 to 150 feet wide. This was a massive space. And I want to tell you about this space, this setting that we are in. This setting, this space served a specific purpose for specific types of individuals. This space was where people who were sick, blind, lame, paralyzed came. Why did they come here? They came with the hopes of being restored. They came with the hope of being delivered. They came with the hope of being set free. They came with the hope of leaving better than they arrived. (laughs) I'm going somewhere with this. If you will walk with me, I want to set the stage a little bit more, though. I imagine... Uh, the, the, the adage, the phrase, misery loves company, was real. Because we are all here for a common issue, and that's to be made well. Uh, whether I'm blind, whether I'm lame, whether you're lame and you're blind, whether I'm paralyzed, whatever it is, we all got an issue. And the issue here is that we are not where we need to be or desire to be, but this place, maybe, can give us what we need. I imagine if I, if I can get Reggie up here real quick, Cam up here real quick, if, if I can get you Lamar G, I imagine that, that all of us here in this common space, I imagine all of us, we've created a, a type of bond. It is through our misery, it is through our affliction, it is through our conflict that we learn to encourage each other. You're blind, but, but I've been lame. And, and, and while you're blind, I'm lame, and you're paralyzed, and you're paralyzed, and we're both lame together, there's a commonality that we share, and then there's a general commonality that we all share is that we got some issues. We, we, we got some issues, and, and there's just collective hope that I imagine we all had at once upon a time, dep- depending on how long we've been here for all hypothetical purposes. Let's say we've been here around the same time, and, and we all have hope. And, and then one day, Reggie steps into the pool, and he receives his deliverance. Reggie, go. That's all right. We're excited for Reggie. We, we're excited for Reggie. He got his deliverance, and, and I believe that, that if, if, if Reggie can get his deliverance, then, then we can get our deliverance. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming into the church space now. Uh, uh, what, what, what other space can we think of where we are sick and, and things aren't right, things aren't perfect, and we assemble onto a common place despite our issues, hoping to have an encounter with Jesus, hoping that we can leave better than the way we came into. But if we are honest, we sit in the same seat Sunday after Sunday next to the same people knowing we got issues, and I struggle with watching people get blessed and delivered, and I ain't. And and the issue ain't with Reggie. The issue is I had the same faith, the same hope, the same desires, and he got it and I didn't. What's going on with us? In fact, I've changed my regimen. I've changed my routine before I come to church. I know church is a place to be, so I'm not giving up on that. And we all touching and agreeing and we praying. And then one day, Cam, go ahead. Cam, get delivered. (laughs) Fella, step this way, please. What happens when? See, it's one thing for us to be stuck together all the time. But it's another, Bryce and Sabrina, when when we come together and we watch people pass us. And don't let your affliction uh, occur after I've been enduring my affliction and you delivered before me. Come on, can we keep it real this morning? Again, it ain't the issue, it's the time that I've been facing this issue, and I know deliverance is in the house, I know liberation is in the house, I know that restoration is in the house, but what do you do when you have a front row seat to someone else's deliverance, and you got to cope with yours when you go home? If nobody was being blessed, I'm cool with that. (laughs) If we all have this common struggle all the time, 
can cope with that because misery loves company. But here in this season, this space that we call church, to know after a while, brothers, my faith, if I'm not careful, my faith will waver. And now there's a greater issue that I must face that's not the issue itself. The issue that we must navigate is this issue that looms over some of us called hopelessness. Well, this is just the way it's going to be. My mama was this way. My daddy was this way. My grandfather was this way. Maybe I'm cursed with it. Maybe this is the thorn in my flesh. We we use spiritual terminology to cope with, ooh, no, I'm going to say that different. I'm going to say that differently. We use spiritual terminology to mask the hopelessness we have. Maybe it's the thorn in my side. Paul said, my grace is sufficient. (laughs) And we use that to mask the misery we have beneath the surface. Well, if, if we just touch in the, the Bible, let's just, let's just, when two or three are gathered, let's just encourage each other in the Lord. You're in the house of mercy, but it's like mercy never comes to you. You're in the house of grace, and you know Jesus is there, but it's like he never visits you. And again, it's not that the issue is terminal. It's not that the issue is detrimental. You can still function with this issue. But it's the fact that it lingers. And it ain't going nowhere. And we're forced to cope with something. And it doesn't appear there's an exit for this season that we're in. Fellas, go ahead and have a seat. I I want to, before we lean into our learning and commence our conversation today, I want to give you this question. Are you prepared? for deliverance because a lot of the problems that we face could it be your delivery opportunities have come and gone but you've missed it because you weren't prepared mentally emotionally and spiritually so I'm crying out but I don't have the right attitude to match what I desire. If you hear nothing else from me today, knowing that the, 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 the main or the foundational issue could not be, it's not the enemy, it's not your mama them, it's not your daddy them, it's the mindset you own. I'm talking to you. Don't look to your left and to your right. I'm talking to the mindset that you have. Even if the situation never changes, what is your attitude about whatever it is you're facing? So this is the question, just some front loading to get us prepared for our learning today. As we go through and we identify some specific attributes and characteristics of becoming delivered and even life after deliverance, are you, it means nothing for me to give this to you if you don't have the mind for it. Let's look into scripture now. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. I want to put this in perspective. Imagine facing a specific issue, physical, emotional, or otherwise, to put in perspective, I'm 36 years old. That means more than I've existed, longer than I've existed. This is the same issue. The same, not not new ones, not greater ones, not lesser ones, the same issue for 38 years. Wrap your mind around that, if you will, because what we do, we, we casually read scripture and we, this is real life. This really happened. This individual has been stuck with this. And he's in the presence, in the right place to potentially be delivered and nothing changes. When Jesus saw him and he knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? Here's the first thing in our mental space that I want us to consider. Deliverance is a choice. Deliverance (laughs) is a choice. I believe that 
Jesus, in his asking of this question, really, I believe this question is ambiguous, it's equivocal in nature. What I mean by that, depending on your perspective, you can interpret this question in two different ways. One of the questions, depending on your perspective, is rooted in possibility, and the other is rooted in desire. Let me, tra- let me, let me translate. The, the, the perspective rooted in what is possible, I believe God is asking this man or some of us, do you think I can deliver you? <laughs> Would you like to get well? Possibility, do you think I can make you well? That's possibility. The other perspective, depending on where we are with our issue, is this. It's rooted in desire. Do you have, let me put it a different way. Are you fine the way that you are? But because God desires to have an encounter with some of us with specific things, and we don't want to be delivered because we feel we are fine. So so I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to touch and agree. I'm not going to intercede because if you're honest with yourself, you really don't want to change. So I got to ask you, it's not, do you think I can do it? It's, do you want me to do it? Would you like to get well? Do you want to be made well? Or are you fine the way? If if you're cool with having a nasty attitude, I'm going to leave you be. If you're cool struggling with pride, I'm going to leave you be. If you're cool with lustful spirit tendencies, I'm going to leave you be. If you're cool with jealousy and envy and fits of rage, I'm going to leave you be. If you're cool being addicted to pornography, I'm going to leave you be. If you're cool with your cursing attitude and spirit, I'm going to leave you be. Because you feel that you are fine the way you are. You are fine the way that you are. So in other words, you are sick of things that you really don't want to be delivered from. (sighs) You act like you want to be delivered from the crisis, but really the crisis fuels your comfort. (laughs) Deliverance is a choice. God is a gentleman. Jesus is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit, they're a gentleman. The Father is a gentleman. Collectively, they make up God and they collectively are gentlemen. I need us to understand this morning that it could be you're facing what you're facing and will continue to face what you're facing, not because it's so weighty. It's because we don't really have the desire to truly be delivered. Until you reach to the point where you're just not sick of it, some of us got to get to the point where we're just tired of being tired. (laughs) I'm just tired. I'm not just tired of it. I'm tired of being tired. Mm. So we have, do you think it's possible for me to deliver you? Or are you fine? So there's no need for me to go through the motions if you cool. If you cool the way you are, God bless you. May the Lord watch. I don't know the rest of the phrase. I just noticed how it start. <laughs> I just wanted to say that somehow. The, 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 the seasoned folks up front know how to say it. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll learn it later at the house. I got it. Okay. Here, oh, this next one. Y'all, th- th- this one right here. He says, I can't, sir. For I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Here's our second thought. Excuses block exits. <laughs> Tony. Excuses, it ain't where you from. It ain't the money in your bank account. It ain't about where you work. It ain't about where you live. It ain't about the car you drive. It ain't about your degrees. It ain't about what church you go to. It's the excuses that you make that block the exits that God has designed for you to encounter. It has nothing to do other than that. Stop making excuses and exit the season that you're in. It's the excuses. What are excuses? Ex- excuses. Some of y'all who pledged just went back into that pledge in mind. <laughs> yes, sir. I hear you, Nate. Um, excuses are what seem to be reasonable explanations. Watch this to shift the blame. 
<laughs> You're asking me a question. And I want you to know, God, Jesus, he doesn't know who Jesus is, but this is a reality for some of us. God, you're asking me if I want to be made well, and it ain't that I'm here, aren't I? But the reason my deliverance hasn't come is because the circumstances, you trying to put it on me, but my circumstances, the stars don't align. I haven't pulled the lucky card. It ain't on me. I'm here because I want to be here, but for whatever reason, I haven't gotten mine. That's a legitimate excuse. Mm. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing that I want us to see about the power of excuses that, that we fail to realize, man. The thing about excuses that we fail to, to see is that excuses are rooted in this thought, bondage. At this point, this man's physical well-being is a blip on the radar. It's insignificant compared to the other things that we see here. It's rooted in bondage. Let me give you some things about excuses here, particularly when our justification seems reasonable and we don't realize that we're in bondage. We can be in emotional bondage, psychological bondage, and spiritual bondage and not even know it. And it's rooted, it's packaged in an excuse. Emotional bondage, it is your feelings will lock you out of opportunities. Your feelings, bitterness, insecurity, depression, anxiety, worry, fear, doubt, your feelings will lock you out of opportunities. Man, I feel, I feel an illustration coming on. Come here, EJ, real quick. Come here real quick. Hustle up for me, man. Uh, um, uh, imagine on the other side, come, come, come stand right in front of this microphone, right here, sir. Right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. Yep. Imagine the microphone is God's desired destination for me. And he comes to me, God sends a man or woman of God or has an encounter, and my emotions block me. Fear, I see fear before I see what he's promised me. Oh, no, I've been in this situation. Doubt, I've been in this situation for too long. There's no way this could be real. What's the strings attached? Doubt. Then, then there is a psychological bondage where your thoughts will lock you out of opportunities. Your thoughts, this right here, this is right here what drives me. It's block. I can't see around what I think about myself, what I think about God beneath the surface, what I think about my issue. My thoughts allow me to aggrandize, make bigger, magnify my issue itself. So I can't, I can't see what he told me is possible because all I see is what's been driving me for six months, a year, two years. That's rooted in a, this right here as an excuse to embrace something that God never designed for me to live permanently with. Here's the other thing, spiritual bondage. Ooh, this is a, this is a good one. When we lock God out of opportunities. Switch with me, Emerson. Huh. If this is the destination and God comes and encounter with us, says, look, if you let me through, let me get through your mind. Let me get through your heart. Let me get through your emotions. I'm going to help you out. And we say, you you can't deliver. I saw you do it for Reggie. Mm -hmm. What if we are the ones blocking God from doing something in our life? We have legitimate excuses on why we feel God can't bless us, but he can bless them. We have legitimate excuses on, well, God can deliver them, but he can't deliver us. And, and, and we work harder at keeping him out than we do just getting out the way and trusting him. And, and, and if I keep it at a buck with y'all, some of us, we have been in this space for a long time. Where we go through the motions of church, we go through the motions of praise and worship, but we really don't think God can fix what we've been facing. And here's the thing, I wanna, oh we, this is good. <laughs> we gotta be careful for the people we allow to validate the excuses we make. Man, I, I got this opportunity, Nate, and da 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 da. Well, we've been down this road before. I don't want you to get your hopes up. We're gonna prepare for the positive, we're gonna expect and believe for the best, but prepare for the worst. This, this is why, who, who's, ooh, this is good. Who's sitting at the pool with you? Mm. Mm. 
mm, beach chairs and everything with no desire to get out. We validate each other. Opportunities come from afar, Tracy, and we don't believe they're really for us. Uh, uh, we, we've been down this road before. We've touched and agreed before. This is just the way it is. And you are my partner in all of this. We're going to be together, ride or die. We're going we gonna to look out for each other through thick and thin. And we have no idea that God desired to deliver us three years ago. Go ahead, EJ. Because our excuses that either we make or people make for us block us from those seasons, those moments of exiting. This ain't the devil. Nope. This ain't your mom. At no point in the scripture does another man speak up on his behalf. He speaks for himself and conveys a reality that feels permanent. I've tried. But every time I've tried in the past, and now he doesn't say this, but I imagine he doesn't even try anymore because he's been there, done that. Next scripture. Verse 8. Jesus told him, stand up. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Now, this next point is profound, and I want to spend some time talking about it. Here we see a man that's blessed beyond his belief. I hear you, baby. I don't know who said it. (laughs) We have a man who's blessed beyond his belief. Now, you may be saying, well, I thought faith was a prerequisite to be free. It is. At the same time, we see God's sovereign nature that despite his lack of belief, his sovereignty delivers him, frees him anyways. Now, while God is sovereign, Miss Rosie, in who he is and what he can do, we can't bank on the fact that he's going to bless us anyways. That's a dangerous territory to live in to say all the time, believe all the time. Well, I'm just whenever he gets around to me, I'm not really believing it, but it is what it is. No, I encourage you to still uh, allow faith to dictate and determine what God has for you or doesn't have for you. Now, here here are a couple things he gives him. This may seem like one, like one miracle Well, it's one miracle, but it's packaged with three different commands. The first one is stand up. The second one is pick up your mat. And the third one is walk. (laughs) One miracle, but there are three different commands. This just dropped in my spirit. This is a download, ladies and gentlemen. uh, It could be that we've missed out on some of the commands that he gave us and we have an incomplete miracle. So the, the miracle is partially, partially functioning, not that the miracle is dysfunctional, it's not functioning in its full capacity because we didn't follow all the commands. Let me break it down to you this way. Some of us want to stand up and walk, but we don't want to carry our mat. <laughs> What does that mean, Pastor? Here, here I'm going to break it down to you. Standing up is the first indication that you are experiencing the blessing right now because you haven't been able to do this. God didn't say Jesus, let me specify, didn't say stand up and walk. He didn't just say experience the blessing. Now testify about the blessing. Walking is a demonstration of what God has done. There's something interesting in between experiencing the blessing and testifying about the blessing. It's being able to remember that you were blessed. Mm. This is a tough pill to swallow for some of us because some of us want to be blessed and act like we ain't go through nothing. It is the mat that is an indication that he's been through some things. It is the mat that he has to carry is an indication that I thought I I recognize you and it's the ooh wee. They recognize your issue, your pain, your problems, and the pain and the problem is what they know you by, so you got to carry it around. Aren't you the one who's been divorced two times? Aren't you the one who has a credit score of so-and-so? Aren't you the one who's applied so-and-so for this job? Aren't you the one who went viral on social media because of a screenshot? We can't do away with the mat. We can't do away with the bed. It is that very thing that God wants 
wants to use to bring him glory. Whether we like it or not, we got to stand up with it and walk with it. And if they bring it up, you say, so what, baby? God is good. This mat is a representation of what he can do for me. And if you stop talking about me, maybe he do some things for you. <laughs> Somebody needs to hear this. Don't be ashamed of your mat, baby. Don't be ashamed of your bed, baby. It may be stinky. It got some stains on it. It's filthy. But that mat brings God glory and he wants to trust you with what he's trying to do in your life and in everybody else's life. Some of us want to stand up and run. He said, nope, you forgot about what you've been through. (laughs) Yeah, what you went through. What you've been facing for so long, it ain't for you to forget about it. It's for your memory to keep you humble. It's a way for individuals to recognize my working power, my transformative power. You can't forget the mat. Transparency, I've said this before. Individuals who knew me when, when they, somebody say, yes, Lord. (laughs) And I know who it was, too, but I ain't going to call you out. (laughs) Individuals who knew me when, Miss Evelyn, when when they would come hear me speak, it was out of skepticism. Because they knew the mat I was carrying. Pride, anger, fits of rage. Well, I would take pride in breaking your spirit. I wanted to bring, I wanted to see, I wanted to bring you to tears. I wanted to have control over your emotions. It was all rooted in some deeper things that I was struggling with and I didn't even know it. And so, Nathan, don't laugh too hard. And the, the, the thing is, individuals, they said, I knew Khalid. In other words, I know the mat he once carried. So when they would come, Destiny, they were so distracted with the legitimacy and the authenticity of how God was using me, that some of these individuals said, I got to come again because it's real. So this time I'm actually come because, oh, watch this, I can look past the mat now, now that I know the miracle is fully fulfilled. So I'm not telling you something that I myself has, haven't dealt with or not dealing with. Uh, we all have a mat that we must carry. We can't just get up and run. We can't just get up and walk. That mat is used as a tool to solidify the miracle. Three commands. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, the latter part of this sermon, we're talking about walking in delivery. If we are honest with ourselves, the the reason some of us won't embrace what God has for us or won't shift our mindset is because his deliverance can feel scary. My bondage is predictable. And I can get comfortable in what's predictable to me. I can arrange, I can sort, I can modify that which is predictable and make myself comfortable. But it is after God frees me where I got a lot of questions. I don't know who's going to stay and I don't know who's going to go. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't, I, don't, I don't even know who's going to be there with me to encourage me in a genuine way. Because there's a lot of people in your ear once you've been delivered, but, but they, they want to see, they want to be close to you to see if it's for real. Mm. So I want to help us walk in our deliverance appropriately. Let's, let's look at this. I'm going to free you with this next, this next slide here. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Here's the critical truth that I want to share with you. Testimonies attract trouble. And a lot of times, it's the verbal assault 
that we receive that makes some of us question, was it even worth it? And, and, and again, and I'm, I'm meeting you where you are. Here's the thing, Miss Marquita, here, here's the thing. You didn't pray for me when I was down. But now you want to punish me because I've been set free? When life was life and you didn't send me a text, you didn't call me, you didn't DM me, but now that you see I'm on the come up, you got something to say. Uh, well, this ain't scripture, it's Mike Jones. Back then you didn't want me. Now I'm hot. You're all on me. That's not in the word of God. That's why I said it's Mike Jones. Thank you. You, you, and, 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 it, and it makes you, if I'm, it, it confuses some of us. If you're not going to rock me when I'm down, I'm okay if you don't rock with me when I come up. Because I don't expect anything from you, but I become befuddled and confused and baffled. Now that you act like you got something to say when I'm on the come up, if you're going to hate on me, be consistent. If you're going to criticize me, be consistent. If you're going to doubt, be consistent. If you're going to worry about what I'm doing, be consistent. I, I like when people are consistent. If you don't like me, don't like me all the time. If you're going to rock with me, rock with me all the time. If you're going to talk about me, talk about me all the time. If you're going to be there for me, be there for me all the time. But don't say something about me when God is moving in my life. Now once did you come and pray for me and you saw I was struggling. In fact, you knew me before the issue took hold of my life and you fell off me, you fell back when you saw I was crashing and burning and now you want to speak up again. Use that same energy all the way through. Be con Look at your neighbor and say, be consistent. be consistent. Be consistent. They don't believe you. They didn't hear it. Tell them again, be consistent. Be consistent. <clears throat> now, some of y'all done told five people. I didn't say tell that many people. <laughs> I ain't going to say who it was, but it was somebody in this front row <laughs> telling everybody, pointing towards the back and everything. <laughs> I said, two people only, Quaylen. <laughs> okay. Here, here, here are two reasons why people struggle with your testimony. It's in the scripture. The Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Here's the first thing. People struggle with your unconventional cure. This don't, this, this uh-uh, your deliverance doesn't play by the rules. Your deliverance doesn't make sense. You're not following the formula that man put in place for you to be set free. You didn't talk to a banker. You didn't talk to a counselor. You didn't talk to a therapist. They didn't lay hands on you. You didn't go through the 11-step the, the program of being set free from this. Yet when God does things that are unconventional and you're cured, your cure can create another crisis for you that you didn't anticipate. People like when you follow the rules because it makes sense. But when it doesn't make sense and you look better than where you were before, or quite frankly, you move further than where they, where they are, then they have an issue because it's not, I can't do anything about that which is unconventional. I can't do anything about those things that play outside the lines of what is appropriate because I know it surpasses my ability and capacity to do it for myself. Number 11, uh, verse 11, excuse me. But he replied, ooh, is somebody about to run in this mug? But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Here's the thing, verse 11 reveals to us why people got beef with you. It is your obedience that fueled the opposition. They only beefing with you because you listened to what God told you to do. They're cool with you if you ain't listening to what the word of God says. They're cool with you if you're not listening to what the Holy Spirit said. If you listen to what they listening to, we all friends. But the moment you say, God told me, look, I, you, you got it. Here's the thing. You, you, your issue with me for no reason. I'm just doing what he told me to do. If you don't like it, you got to look at his agenda. If you don't like it, look at his planner. If you don't like it, look at his calendar. But for whatever reason, in this moment in time, he's directed me to do what I'm doing now. And I ain't got nothing to do with that. 
Could it be that some of the issues you're facing is because you said, God, I trust you? Yeah. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, here's, here's a, a pen, uh, a, a point for your pen that I want to give you. Um, if individuals are struggling with your obedience, they don't need to sit by you poolside. They, they just go ahead and take their beach chair. You got to go sit somewhere else, bro. You, and, and here's the thing. Some of us are not comfortable removing people from our lives <laughs> because we want to be loyal, because we want to prove ourselves to be true, ride or dies. But there comes a point in time where individuals who are struggling with your obedience or individuals who are struggling with God is doing your life in an unconventional way. There comes a point in time where you got to ask yourself, are you even worth keeping around anymore? Because I'm already concerned about what God is doing in my life and I can't use this energy because I'm fragile, I'm weak, I'm vulnerable. And and, and if you say the wrong thing at the wrong time, I may end up backwards and I don't want to go backwards. I I need to remove you from my life. Not because I'm mean, not because I'm unfair, but I got to protect this very miracle that God has blessed me with. Mm. Some of us protect friendships more than we protect our faith. (laughs) we'll lie and say we ain't going to church to keep a friend i'm gonna just run some errands today and then i'll be back say you're going to church if they have an issue with you obeying what god has called you to do which is not forsake the assembly what god has called you to do be holy and righteous i'm just trying to make some improvements in my life you know what i'm saying no bro i'm look i give my life to christ recently and and look i can tell you about them i'm not gonna force them on you i'm not gonna judge you but i'm trying to make some different decisions in my life so i i, I i'm gonna cut back on the cussing i'm not gonna drink i'm not gonna smoke i'm not gonna do all those things it's a pro- i'm a work in progress don't judge me if you can't give me the grace but goodbye Goodbye. I heard somebody put it this way one time. Some of us need to learn the gift of goodbye. I see you. I see you. When I see you tomorrow, I'll give you a head nod. I'll dap you up and we we can chat. We can do small talk, but we can't rock like that no more. Goodbye. Goodbye. I got a purpose that I'm trying to fulfill. I'm trying to maximize this miracle in my life. I cannot go backwards, forwards only. I may stumble, I may crawl, but backwards is not anywhere but backwards. And as long as you are around, you compromise my progress, goodbye. Okay. This one is going to make some of us uncomfortable, but it's okay. Verse 12 and 13, 14. Who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now now you are well, so stop sinning. Or something even worse may happen to you. Here's Here's the thing. This is probably the most critical point that you need to receive when we talk about walking and deliverance. Mm-hmm. Thomas hit me with it. Stop self-sabotaging. Oh, say that. <laughs> when I say self-sabotage, I'm talking about an internal decision to inflict ourselves, which inhibit our ability to continue to move forward. There, there are a couple things here that I want to take away from this um, Some of what you faced or will continue to face is due to you getting in your own way. That's that's really what it comes down to. Jesus, while speaking to the man, we can lean in and eavesdrop and be encouraged through this, that some of the issues I face are not because life life in, it's because of me. Chip, Renata, this doesn't make sense to me. If God didn't save us to remain the same or to keep going back to square one. He did not save us to remain the same or keep going back to square one. Here's the thing. What Jesus is talking about here, he's not talking about a physical condition. He's talking about a spiritual one. We're not talking about physical sickness. We're talking about spiritual sickness. In the, in the short term, Jesus is talking about the consequences of spiritual sickness, specifically when we go back to square one and fight demons that he's delivered us from. 
I've delivered you from so-and-so. I'm not going to put anything particular out there. I'll let you fill in the blank. I've delivered you from so-and-so, but you got comfortable in a miracle. You left your mat somewhere, and now you're back at square one asking me to deliver you again. And my Bible makes it very clear, Destiny, that if we're not careful, the Bible says that when the house is swept clean and it remains unoccupied, that is by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit ruling and abiding in our lives, what happens is when it's left unoccupied or vacant, that same spirit comes back with seven times stronger. Now, I don't know if it's the same kind of demon, Nate, that's seven times stronger. I don't know if it's seven of the same, uh, seven, one and then seven more. I'm not sure. All I know is you end up in worse shape. That's all I need to know. It's not about, sometimes it's not about the same things. It's about being delivered from one thing, going back to the same thing, and you end up in worse shape. So your alcoholism is magnified now. Your lustful spirit is magnified now. You've been delivered from fits of rage. Now you're just snapping over every little thing because you left the house unkept. Because you weren't careful, as Jesus told us, he as he told this man, stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. The other thing that, that um, and we come on up here, EJ, I'm wrapping up, sir. Uh, the, the other thing that's short term, long term, is that you and I, if we continue to live in sin, if we leave those things unaddressed, long term, we can run the risk of spending eternity with God. That's a fact. So some of the things that we're sick of, out of our control, God wants to keep them there, but you can control your perspective. And then there are other things in our lives that we can control that are aligned to our spiritual well-being. And God said, you keep playing with this fire, it's going to destroy you. You play with it, it ain't just going to burn you, it's going to destroy you. And and I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm speaking a reality here that that we just got to do something. If you're sick of it, act like you're sick of it. I mean, I'm talking about the things that we can manage. Some things that a lot, when God calls us to be holy and righteous, those things within ourselves that align with spiritual sickness that displeases God, we could do something about that with the help of the Holy Spirit. And God is saying, address it. Stop playing with it. Here's our big idea, then we're going to get out of here. Bondage is not required with your burden. Bondage, you being bound... It's not required with Jesus Christ. It's not required. Some of us think bondage and burdens go hand in hand. They don't. You got a burden. We all got burdens. We all got issues. We all got crosses to bear, but it doesn't have to keep you in bondage. And in fact, Christ didn't die for you to stay in bondage. He didn't. Well, I've always been this way. Guess what? It's a great opportunity for God to sign you up for his miracle working power. I, I, that's the only thing I can tell you. If, if you feel that there is no option, then there's only one option. Jesus Christ. You're looking at someone. I ain't perfect. I want to make that very clear. But I know what God has done in my life. I know what I've been delivered from. I know what I've been set free from. And I know I have enough sense with the help of the Holy Spirit to know certain things I don't want to even entertain anymore. Say that, say that. The spiritual sickness, those things that affected me at one point in time, Jose, when I gave them to God once and for all, didn't mean it didn't get discouraging, didn't mean it get, didn't get hard sometimes, but I felt good knowing that God is pleased with me. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Think about that issue. And think about how you have been, how it has impacted what you expect from God, how it's impacted your well being, how it's impacted your disposition, your attitude. Do you have any hope? Are you still fighting? Or have you given up and said, this is just the way it is. I'm always going to be a cusser. I'm always going to be addicted to alcohol. I'm always going to be a liar. I'm always going to be this. That's a trick of the enemy. Your problem doesn't have to be permanent. In fact, God wants to free you.
Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. There's some things that we are tired of. We're tired of specific issues, but we should be even more tired of how it makes us feel. What it's done to our disposition, our mindset, our perspective, our attitude. We should be sick of that more than the issue itself. You make it very clear that we should not be surprised about the trials that we face. We should anticipate troubles of all kinds because we live in an imperfect world. And so we can't control what necessarily comes to us all the time. But there are some things that we can manage and control based off of the decisions that we make or the perspectives that we have. And God, I believe that you're still in the miracle working business. I believe you can meet us where we are today. When you ask us this morning, do you want to be made well? We can say yes, because it's a desire and because we believe it's possible. Now as people all over this room, God, give you that issue, meet them where they are. Let us be open and honest about whatever it is we're facing today. This is the space. This is the, the pool of Bethesda in many regards. This is the house of mercy. This is the place where we come to get delivered. This is the place where we come with an anticipation to become, to be better, to be restored. This is the moment. Now we know that your, your, wonder, your miracle working power is not bound to this building, but man, what an awesome opportunity to come with other, together with other individuals who are not well and to get blessed together. And any fear of the unknown, any fear of being uncomfortable, any fear of not having control because of the lack of predictability, God, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. We've been learning in your sovereignty and your amazing power that you are in control of everything. Let us tackle the emotional bondage. Let us tackle the spiritual bondage. Let us tackle the psychological bondage, our thoughts, our feelings that contradict what you desire. And God, as we prepare to stand and pick up our mat and walk, let us point everybody to you. When they say, I thought you were, yes, I am that person. And God is using me for his glory. If God can do this in my life, he can do it for you. Let us be unashamed of what you continue to do in our lives. Let us take pride in what you've done in our lives. All for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand clap of praise.